Hi, and welcome to Extra Serving, a Nation's Restaurant News podcast. I'm your host, Holly Petrie. Today, we're going to be talking about earnings from this week. Uh, Chipotle and Yum have both reported, so we're going to hear a little bit about that, what our takeaways are from those. Um, we're also going to be talking about Chick-fil-A's new cauliflower plant-based test, um, which is super exciting. Uh, they haven't released a plant-based item before, so we're going to hear all about that and Um, we don't have Alicia on the podcast, but she did tell us what it tastes like. So we could talk about it like that. (laughs) Our secondhand taste. Um, we also launched our chicken showdown this week. So we can talk about exactly what that means, what you guys can do to participate, um, and more. So before I get to our advertiser, I'm going to introduce my co-host. I am Sam Okus, editor-in-chief of Nation's Restaurant News, and I've missed you guys. It's been a couple weeks. (laughs) <laughs> I'm Leanne Zinsmeister, Managing Editor of Nation's Restaurant News, and um, I missed you guys a little. I, I, I thought totally. you were I was expecting that too, so I'll take it as a win. <laughs> what can you say? I'm in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I'm going to turn it over to our advertiser for this. Everyone in the industry knows that Smithfield Culinary has a full line of great, ready-to-cook, ready-to-eat products with Smithfield and Margarita. But what else is cooking? Tap into the latest culinary trends and get inspired with new recipes created by real working chefs from across the country. Bring more to the table with flavors and menu ideas your guests will savor. Visit smithfieldculinary.com or follow Smithfield Culinary on social media. All right, well guys, welcome back. I feel like I haven't seen either of you in it's forever. Been a bit. I mean, we do I talk s- pretty much every day, even when we don't podcast together. So, and I saw you yesterday in the office. I don't know if you remember the place where we go to do our jobs. Holly I'm has selective memory. Remember. She has selective memory yesterday. around podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> just selective. Well, I have another podcast meeting. idea. Well, last week it was me, Brad, Hold on. and Alicia. <laughs> podcast podcast, what is podcast idea or movie idea? idea. Somebody whose memory exists purely in podcast form, right? What if Holly only remembers when she's recording at, via podcast? Those are her only memories. All right, listeners, Leanne and I both made the same horrified face. Um, so and I those, those of you Hollywood that. producers <laughs> who want to jump at that idea, my phone number is. Yeah, give your fun to Brown on the podcast, Sam. Let's you. do it. Could be fun. Could be fun. <laughs> uh, well, I podcasted with Alicia and Brett last week, which was very fun. I heard you I had to say. cut a lot of it. I really did enjoy. There was a lot left on the cutting room floor. Uh, we talked for about an hour. So uh, there was a lot on you the cutting room floor. Listeners. But it was mm-hmm. very cool. I mean – I think it would have been interesting. We talked about a lot of cool stuff, but we got off topic a lot. So it was almost like a Holly Sam Uh podcast, um, but double. This is why Leanne has to be on every podcast. She has to enforce the law. I mean, I cut it, so it was it was great in the end. So (laughs) it's just more work for me. More work for you, and more of a time suck for your co-hosts. Touche. Well, they loved it. They call it team building. Yeah, call it team building. Let's talk to our CEO and tell him we were team building. They're talking about building a podcast booth at the office, which is very exciting. So uh, that's something to look forward to. Too. Yeah, I know. That's I see news to face, me. Sam. Nobody told me about that. So should These I fly into New York every week to record my podcast? <laughs> These are the riveting <laughs> conversations you miss when you're not in the office. Darn. Yes. That we had over Krispy Kreme. Oh. Fun. It was very, the Krispy Kreme was very good. I was very excited about it on a personal note. Um, but on a professional note, let's get to talking nice about earnings. Well mm-hmm. Thank you. I've been working on it. Um, Alicia was really queen of segues last week. I mean, she was like talking about this. And you know, this person did this too. I know we're going to get to that later. But, and then I was like, Alicia, you just did a perfect segue. We're going to need a Holly (laughs) segue meter to measure the strength of our segues. (laughs) All right, well, let's talk about earnings. Um, Chipotle and Yum reported. uh, So, I mean, what are some of the big takeaways from you guys for these earnings reports? We also had McDonald's already report. We had Starbucks report. Um, I mean, we've seen we've already seen a few people trickle out of the system. So, what are some of your key takeaways? I, yeah, go ahead, Liam. <laughs> we both did that I, lip I, smack I, lab. I, 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 <laughs> um, 
I think the biggest lesson here is that if you raise your menu prices enough, you can, at least for the time being, outrun inflation and outrun the maybe possible recession. So many, uh, obviously, restaurants across the board raising menu prices for a multitude of reasons. Uh, so far, most brands, most companies are seeing some pretty solid same store sales increases. But we're also really seeing the trickle down economy effect. Um, we haven't really heard from any big casual dining companies yet this quarter. Um, so not sure how they're doing. But in general, fast casual brands, including Chipotle, are doing okay, but underperforming expectations, while the QSR brands, um, including McDonald's and Taco Bell, are just killing it out there. And that, to me, says that people are, you know, going to their less expensive alternatives in this economic climate. So great for QSRs, okay for fast casuals. I'm not super optimistic for what we'll see from casual dining, but I hope they prove me wrong. Uh, but yeah, menu prices across the board, and I am curious to see how that plays out longer term as the economy does whatever it's going to do, um, and as if restaurants ha are forced to start no longer increasing their menu prices. Yeah. As the economy does whatever. 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 I do, guys. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> the economy and, and its whims. Um, actually, and speaking of that, just quick tangent on our – uh, Emerging Restaurant Tour live learning series yesterday. Victor Fernandez of Black Box Intelligence was citing some details on um, the chances of recession. And actually, the chances of recession actually are going down, um, that people are more optimistic that a recession might not happen. But, um, you know, who knows what could happen? Any number of things could. So uh, just to echo everything Leanne was saying, yeah, that that's what jumps out to me too, is that um, customers are trading down out of uh, probably casual, we will find out here in the next week or two. Um, but certainly from the Chipotle's of the world to the McDonald's of the world, Chipotle was um, definitely an eye opener for me because Chipotle had been doing so well. Um, but they had admitted a couple of quarters ago that they were seeing the trade down start because of inflation. They were seeing customers trade down to McDonald's and Taco Bell. And so I think we're seeing further proof of that. Um, I think another number that jumped out was just that digital sales at Chipotle went down. And that's surprising because Chipotle, especially, they, I mean, they've been killing it, it feels like, for a couple years now. But especially the, the digital sales have really um, been one of their strong sides and that digital sales were down. And so I don't know what to make of it. I guess one last thing I would say, though, is I'm curious to know what the um, eat at home, eat uh, eat away from home split is. And, and when we say eat at home, eat away from home, mostly I mean restaurant, supermarket. You know, maybe we need to get Chloe in from Supermarket News to come chat with us because I would be curious how much inflation is driving more people to do, to make their own meals, to go to the supermarket. Um, because if we look at like digital sales at Chipotle going down, I mean, that could be just a sign of, well, Chipotle sales in general down because people are going to QSR and they're doing drive through they're not doing delivery. But I'm just curious if, if people are doing delivery less, are we actually seeing more of not just a trade down out of fast casual, but are we seeing a trade out of dine out because menu prices have gone up and because people are, are, are maybe, you know, thinking, well, I'll just, I'll just do more grocery shopping and I can go to the supermarket for a value and, and just make my own meal and I won't have to pay for service and fees and things like that. I, I don't know the answers to that, but um, I think that has traditionally happened in the past when we have economies like we have. And so um, something to think about that we might be having more of the supermarket um, resurgence as restaurants just have to keep fighting with with price increases. I mean, in my personal use case, I've traded down from any kind of order out food to only cooking my own meals. Yesterday, I even brought food into the office, and I usually get a fast cash salad. So, I mean, I've traded down. Are you personally. saying Taco Bell had a nine percent increase in same store sales this quarter without your help? <laughs> Uh huh. Wow, I, th I figured you'd be a solid one or two percentage points. Imagine where they would be with Holly's business. No, no, I I was zero percent of that nine percent. Well done, good for you. I was negative. I was because I, I usually buy from them, so I was actually negative in there. Interesting. Nicely done. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, I am cooking all my meals at home now, um, and I'm bringing them with me. So it's very, it's very. Um, well, and I don't know. This may not be your case, Holly, but you know, early year for those holdouts with New Year's resolutions and health. Obviously, there's a little bit more of a health halo around preparing your own food. You know, that could have something to do with it too. Um, look, we don't have hard data to tell us whether or not it's true that people are preparing their own meals instead of doing restaurants. But I, I have done a lot of DoorDash lately. Our family has done a lot of DoorDash. We've done a lot of restaurants, just kind of with things going on lately, and. I will tell you, I have had a lot of just, you know, hand to forehead moments when I look at the cost. <laughs> it's just like truly, truly insane how much money I'm spending on DoorDash it, for, for some restaurants where, not to name any names, but I'm just like, I should not be spending this amount of money because I'm lazy. But that's the lazy tax, I guess you could call it. <laughs> that's what restaurants count on. <laughs> they do. Absolutely. Yeah. And I have just no time in my life whatsoever for basically anything outside of work and parenting. So yeah, I don't have time to, you know, take 20 minutes to drive to that restaurant 10 minutes away, grab food and come home. You know, of course I I'm going to do DoorDash. Part of why restaurants like McDonald's and Taco Bell are doing so well right now is because a lot of parents, like especially working parents, can't trade out of eating out at all. You know, right. they don't have the time or the energy to commit to cooking three meals a day for however many people. Um, and so they're all now going to McDonald's and Taco Bell. And I say right. good for those kids because those were my favorite dinners as a kid. <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. I kids cannot are tell you. loving this economy. <laughs> oh, my kids and happy meals. I mean, my kids, the shows they watch on TV, there's so many happy meal commercials and my kids oh, just no. light up and, and not for nothing. I don't know if I might be connecting dots here that don't are can't be connected, but there ha there's also data recently about the uh, increase in people who are commuting again and you have to imagine that with the increase in commuting comes an increase in drive-through business because you're on your way home you don't want to spend the extra money for the DoorDash fees so you spend through the drive-through of course who has drive-throughs QSRs have drive-throughs so maybe there's something going on there too I'm curious how Shake Shack's numbers are doing because they have all these suburban drive-throughs now they do yeah I got one five minutes from my house um I can't tell you it increases my Shake Shack business, but it does. Uh, it is a, we are definitely the family of if we're all in the van and don't want to get out, we just do a drive through. I tell you who also has a drive through five minutes from my house, Torchy's Tacos. That's like one of their first drive throughs. Yeah, it's awesome. Taco wow, Tuesday gorgeous. for us is just like to have that as an option. Um, I think we talked about this on the podcast before, but yeah, the rise in like fast casual drive throughs is so perfectly tailored to my lifestyle. Um, and so yeah, if there's any <laughs> proof that the rising commutes, uh, the trickle down to QSR, especially if we end up in a recession and value is important, word to all fast casuals out there that are not looking at drive through. <laughs> look at drive through because it is so important to so many people. Yeah, well, let's talk about Chick-fil-A now. I don't have a segue for it. Um, so we're just going to talk about Chick-fil-A. You know who else Chick has drive-thrus? Chick-fil-A. Uh, Chick hey, who here we go. Has. That, seems like a, that seems like a Leanne, corny segue. So Leanne, I, I give you a 4 out of 10 on the Holly segue scale. I'll take it. Yeah, that I was a corny one. I will take it. <laughs> Um, so Chick-fil-A is testing a new plant-based proprietary protein, which is cauliflower. You say cauliflower um, weird. I was just going to ask her to say that word again. <laughs> cauliflower. Oh, shucks. The cauliflower. <laughs> That's how I say it. Cauliflower. The like eye is doing a lot of work like there. Cauliflower. The eye is, is doing a lot of work. Is that how your parents taught you those words? All the words <laughs> rhyme with Holly, actually. Every <laughs> word rhymes with Holly. No. Maybe that's how we say it in New York because I've always heard cauliflower. Yeah. All right, well, after Midwest, this, I'm going to video call all of our colleagues and make them say this word. Yeah. The resident Ohioans on the call, uh, being two-thirds of us, say cauliflower. So maybe that's a Midwest thing. Yeah. Add it to the budget for our full team today, Yeah, Sam. maybe it is. Yes, I will. We'll on our, our the upcoming <laughs> team meeting, everybody, say this word. Make Joanna say it, because Joanna's the only other New Yorker in the, in the room. Okay. Noted. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about cauliflower. Well done. There we go. Nailed it. That felt weird. Um, 
So, <laughs> so Chick-fil-A is a little late to the game, um, but it took them four years to come up with this blend. Um, Alicia wrote a really great story about how they uh, created it and this whole process that was involved in making this four-year proprietary blend. But I mean, I think the real question is, is Chick-fil-A too late to the game? Uh, you know, it's um, inter- an interesting question because we've talked as a team some about a lot of the signs we're seeing are a softening in the plant-based market. Um, and I think most of the restaurants, anecdotally, what I hear from just a lot of restaurant operators is just nobody's buying this stuff. You know, it's it feels like one of those things you develop for the veto vote. You have something plant based on the menu, so you can get the you know vegans, vegetarians, etc. of of the family. You know, won't veto the the family visit, um, and it feels a little bit like we are sort of coming into we're settling into plant based perhaps as a niche. Now there are a number of factors at play that could be throwing us off the scent here. I mean, it could be that it's a legitimate market for the future, but because of inflation, um, because of various factors, people just aren't going, you know, maybe they're indulging more. I know we, um, in the early days of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about, oh, because of just the hardship at home, people want indulgence and that's why they're springing for pizza and wings and the plant-based isn't going to make it. Maybe there's some holdover from that. I don't know. It's hard to say. And depending on who you ask, I think some people still really believe in plant-based, but I would say just broadly speaking, it seems like they're softening in plant-based. So it is kind of funny. We did joke about this as a team that, you know, uh, Chick-fil-A having spent four years developing this item, they might've been like, everybody wait, just wait, just wait, just, you know, we're going to have this item out soon. You know, don't give up on your plant-based eating just yet. Um, So I don't know, but According to Alicia, our colleague, this is a legitimately good sandwich. I will say, as somebody who both frequents Chick-fil-A a lot and somebody who loves cauliflower wings, I am going to get this if it ever shows up in my local Chick-fil-A 100%. Um, and so it's unique. It's different. It's not your standard you know, uh, Beyond Meat patty, which, of course, doesn't make any sense for Chick-fil-A anyway. But um, I think it will get people's attention. The question is, you're, you're right, Holly. The question is, is it too late? Or are enough Chick-fil-A customers really interested in something like this? And can it convert people who might want to go meatless and instead be interested in something like cauliflower? Yeah, I think maybe slow but steady might win the race here because, like Sam said, Alicia liked it. Um, maybe, you know, taking the time. They were really diligent about this development. Um, everyone should go read Alicia's um, interview with their culinary guy um, because you can tell how much care they put into this. They didn't want to, like, churn out a plant-based product just for the sake of it, uh, which I respect. The other thing is, it, it like, Sam's right. Like, we do hear from operators that people aren't really buying these things, but we're still seeing them all the time. I mean, plant-based protein is one of the trends that, Brett identified for 2022 and wrapped up at the end of last year. So, you know, it feels late, but I think in this scenario, it might be a case of like, there's no such thing as late or like better late than never. Um, But we'll see, you know, how it, how it performs, if it ends up being a system wide rollout. Um, It I'll say it's the first plant-based innovation in a long time that has intrigued me. Like I'm, actually genuinely curious to see how this unfolds same i mean a sandwich looks good like it genuinely looks Looks like a chick-fil-a sandwich you know and and that's part of the uh, that's part of the challenge for a lot of uh of uh, restaurants going the direction of plant-based which is you don't want this you, you want it to taste as close to a an item, another item on their menu as possible. Um, uh, when we hear from, we did the plant-based showdown. Sorry, I'm going to spoil our potential segue here. But uh, when we did our plant-based showdown last year, a lot of the brands that we were focused on, the plant-based brands, were trying to mimic the taste of fast food because – you know, the point is not necessarily have really delicious v- vegetarian and vegan food and they will come. It's more like how do we convince regular fast food goers to have food that still tastes like fast food but happens to be vegetarian and vegan? That's what Chick-fil-A is going for. Um, so, can't again, will they be able to 
um, convince enough people to do that. Maybe. I mean, again, like, you know, I, I eat at Chick-fil-A a lot because I have kids. There's one by right by my house. They have drive throughs and it just fits into my lifestyle very perfectly. And I can't eat their fried chicken sandwich all the time. And no offense to Chick-fil-A, I don't care for their grilled chicken sandwich. So as another option, uh, another health option, you know, this, this makes a lot of sense. They also seem to be putting a lot of marketing power behind it. I mean, how often do we get a press release, you know, at nine o'clock on a weekday morning that says, hey, we're launching this new menu item, but Chick-fil-A flew Alicia out to Atlanta, hosted her at their headquarters for a day, had her sample the sandwich along with the traditional chicken sandwich. I mean, it seems like they're putting a lot of effort behind this launch. Definitely. And it seems like it's going to work for them. I mean, Chick-fil-A is like one of the biggest restaurant companies out there. They're only open six days a week. They'd probably be number one if they're open seven days a week. Let's be real. Um, So, I mean, like they have this huge customer base. I can't imagine it's not going to, I can't imagine it's going to flop. I mean, Sam, you even said you don't like their grilled chicken sandwich and I feel like that's still doing well. So how could a cauliflower not do well? Yeah, it just depends on their core demographic and whether this fits within something that their core demographic is interested in. I mean, look, if Chick-fil-A only, you know, gets, if it only makes up 1% of their business, it's still, you know, a uh, uh, nine figure business, <laughs> right? Like I had to do the, had to do the <laughs> simple math in my head. Sorry, everybody, not a mathematician over here. I might've blown it. All of you mathematicians out there, please check my numbers, but it's still massively successful. And it could be that they're comfortable with that, right? Depending on, you know, the um, cost of this product, that's something I'm not, I don't know if we, we got that information. Like what, what does this cost to Chick-fil-A? Is there any additional time asked of, operators. I don't know the answers to that, but if if it fits seamlessly into their operation, having something like this, which again can cancel the veto vote and at least just be a niche menu item, you know, that, that would make sense. And it's proprietary. So at the end of the day, they don't have to rely on a vendor, you know, who could jack up prices. They don't have to rely on a vendor who could run out of product or who, you know, is working with their competitors. It's something that they can control. So again, like any kind of sales with this item will probably make sense for them. Yeah. Well, jumping from one chicken chain that's testing plant-based to a bunch of chicken chains that are doing nice. a lot of chicken. Uh, we lost our, thank you. Oh, you rate that? Okay. That's, that's fine. Uh, this is substantial. Um, so we launched our chicken showdown, which is uh, a bunch of chicken chains, nine to be exact, um, chicken chains that are doing great things in the industry, uh, whether it's chicken tenders, uh, fried chicken, nuggets, can't name any other kinds of chicken, wings. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> um these chains are doing some really great things. And so we launched this chicken showdown. We've done a few other showdowns. So um as you guys know, I'm sure by now, you get to vote in this. Uh, you get to tell us which chain you think is going to be the next big thing. Um, we have chains that have five units. We have chains that have over 100 units in this. Uh, but we didn't have any of the big players. So like Chick-fil-A is not involved. Um, it's all these emerging brands that we think could, you know, really become something big. Some of them have already gotten there. I mean, we have Dave's Hot Chicken in there. Dave's Hot Chicken is like one of the next big things that's coming up that everybody kind of agrees on. But we also have brands that are surprising that we think could really take over that spot too. Um, And so it's up to you guys to vote. I mean, Sam, what was it like for you to be part of this? Magical, Holly. It was everything I dreamed (laughs) that it would be. Uh, It was, yeah, look, we we collaborated on this list as a team. um, And it was tough, right? I mean, there's a lot of exciting chicken players out there. That's right. Why we're doing the showdown is... We, we're trying to validate across the industry who are the restaurant brands that legitimately stand a shot at national expansion because every single one of you tells us we're going to be the next big thing and blah, 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 right? Um, but we want to know what does the industry think because we know that um, some chains – uh, have reputations in the industry as being really exciting. There are some chains out there that everybody's really watching, paying attention to. And so that's why we've done this showdown series. We'll continue to do it this year, which is to say we're going to pick a group of them who we think is uh, stands a good shot at 
becoming household names essentially. But we give you the chance in the audience to vote, um, which you can do at our LinkedIn or on our Instagram. There are links on or, or on, on TikTok. TikTok. Yes, that magical platform I have no idea how to use. You can go there and vote there too. So yes, if please weigh in because um, we just want to know what what does the industry think is uh, uh, a top chicken player. And Holly, to your point, we've got a variety of of chicken brands here. Um, one in your guys' neck of the woods, Fields Good Chicken, is really like health oriented and doing rotisserie chicken and healthful cooking. And then Dave's doing hot chicken, Cracked Shack, which is talking about doing chicken with like a fine dining approach, essentially. Um, Slim Chickens, which is you know, chicken tenders in a, a little bit more of a, you know, relaxed setting, but fast casual. They're, it's kind of all over the map in terms of what the service is, what the product is. Um, but all of them have some unique hook that makes them exciting. So what what is, what which of these chains is most exciting? That is up to you. Dun, dun, dun. Boom. Mic drop. <laughs> That was a good explanation. Hey, Thank you, Sam. It's my pleasure. <laughs> well, you guys, we did it once again. Go us. I am going to throw it over to Nick Chavez, CMO of KFC. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to say thank you guys and Holly, have a great rest there of was day. a really easy segue it's just staring you in the face right there for the guest. Uh, well, speaking of chicken leaders, huh? I give myself. I no, I gave myself an 8 out of 10 on the Holly Segway score. <laughs> and you are in charge, so. I win. Oh, my God. All right. Well, thank you guys again. I'm going to throw Thanks, it over to Nick Chavez. Thanks. Everyone in the industry knows that Smithfield Culinary has a full line of great, ready-to-cook, ready-to-eat products with Smithfield and Margarita. But what else is cooking? Tap into the latest culinary trends and get inspired with new recipes created by real working chefs from across the country. Bring more to the table with flavors and menu ideas your guests will savor. Visit smithfieldculinary.com or follow Smithfield Culinary on social media. So, um, yeah, I know you're new-ish. Mm-hmm. Ish. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. but you came on, you know, to the brand at a really interesting time where there had been an uptick in sales, sort of a recovery. Net new unit growth for the first time was in the conversation. Yeah. Um, so it seemed like, you know, a lot of the things were working, and I had written about the marketing campaigns working. You know, it's working, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, generating that a, a stronger sales base, a little bit younger consumer. Mm-hmm. Um, since 2016, I think, is, is about when that started happening. So I, I'm just curious to know your priorities coming in, riding that sort of momentum, but shifting, from my perspective, what seems pretty dramatically away from, you know, celebrity kernels. Mm. Um, is it, was it just time? Because, you know, from on the surface, it seemed like it was working. So I, I just mm. kind of want to get your perspective about, okay, you came in with this base of, of uh, you know this cadence was working, and then you want you came in with a new perspective. So talk to me a little bit through through uh, through that change. Sure. Yeah, I think the the uh, the brand has had tremendous momentum over the past eight years, and um, you know certainly one of the key um, moments during that eight year period was was the uh, the onset of COVID nineteen uh, throughout the course of the world, and and uh, and then the post. It, you know, hopefully now moving really into a post uh, COVID world and that certainly changed you know consumer dynamics um, certainly changed uh, the eating from home dynamics the home meal replacement uh, dynamics and you know so as we came in we recognize or as I came in you know I recognized that there were certain tailwinds um, you know fueling uh, the KFC business the KFC brand and um, and certainly that there were also potentially some headwinds on the horizon with um, uh, really inflation spiking in late uh, uh, 2021. You know, gas prices, the 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 you know the price that all of us were paying for basic goods and and services, 
and knew that uh, a we needed to really get uh, serious about everyday value in KFC again and and really make sure that uh, we were providing good value for the money um, for every trip from our core customers into our stores uh, a B I think is as you reference um, the the journey to age you know uh, to expand our audiences uh, from a core audience, uh, which is uh, getting a little bit older, to younger families and younger audiences, is really a multi-year uh, journey. I think, uh, candidly, we've really continued uh, continued that path uh, that we've been on for the last five or six years that that uh, that you referenced. And then um, C, what I will say though, with regard to the Colonel, is a, a you know he's a critical part of our brand, our our voice, our style, um, you know. His voice is, is in it every TV commercial we make uh, to this day. Uh, what we noticed, however, was that um, where we really had an opportunity was to be more relevant um, to new audiences through the, the food we serve and the people we serve. And um, while the Colonel was great, uh, the Colonel advertising was great and uh, very distinctive, um, you know, the the colonel as as showman was a little bit distant from <laughs> the finger licking good food mm -hmm. that we promised to consumers every single day. So the key pivot to us was was not really abandoning the colonel. He'll always be with us, but um, moving a little bit from you know an enduring image of, from our advertising of colonel and 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 packaging <laughs> candidly to customers and, and food. Um, and in particular, the original recipe, you know, finger licking good food that, um, that we serve day in and day out. So we wanted to convert, I guess, some of that distinctiveness, some of that attention getting uh, quality of the kernel advertising into actual relevance and actual visitation uh, okay. through our new approach. And then I, I am curious because, you know, there was such a, a huge amount of attention paid, you know, in, the, in that, what, four or five years. Um, on the kernel, who is it going to be? Who you know, and, mm -hmm. and is that is it fair to say that you're shifting then from that to more of a product based um, marketing uh, standpoint, or is that is that sort of the way it's going? I think it's fair to say that uh, more of our um, marketing and media investment is in um, uh, really the great products and food that we serve, uh, whether it's our uh, all new wraps, our sandwiches our um, uh, nuggets to come in uh, in April um, but even um, products like we've showcased in the back half of last year uh, our bowls our famous bowls our mac and cheese bowls so certainly a, a large larger percentage of our overall uh, media and marketing investment and our efforts is is uh, ensuring people even know frankly about our sandwich mm -hmm. that, that they've tried our sandwich uh, today, you know, you, you mentioned it was the first time you've tried our buffalo ranch sauce. Yeah, that's that was definitely a gap that we were seeing. Is um, while the kernel uh, and some of the silly and fun kernel advertising was great for uh, you know distinctiveness and uh, putting um, you know a smile on people's faces. We really needed to get uh, back to, if you will, um, our. Uh, Taste, uh, our, the taste, the quality, uh, the original recipe flavor uh, of our food. Yeah. And uh, I know it, it, it seems my, my takeaway from your conversation today is mm -hmm. your priority is very much, your number one priority is very much younging down the brand. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I say, say it more along the lines of expanding okay. the audiences for our brand becoming a more inclusive, a more inviting, a more welcoming brand to people of all ages. Um, so uh, certainly for, for us, the next step there is um, in families with, with kids and teens and young adults in the household. Um, you know, we, <laughs> we like to say, you know, KFC is Sunday night dinner seven days a week. And, um, you know that's it's we offer great solutions and and great fried chicken great sides for for busy families um, 
and um, and we need to make sure that those families, uh, each you know, successive generation of families is choosing KFC. Um, Have you seen, give me sort of an idea then when you look at your internal data as much as you can share, what kind of color you can provide about what your consumer, your typical average consumer age-wise, demographic-wise was, and maybe what you're striving for when you say broaden that audience. Mm. I think it's fair to say that our core customer, the customer who comes to KFC most frequently, uh, is older than the average QSR customer. Um, and that's great, that's fine, we love them. <laughs> we love our, our core and loyal customers and we wanna continue to serve them with a, a finger licking good experience every single day. And we need to uh, bring in new audiences and invite new generations of customers to discover uh, and in some cases rediscover KFC. Um, everyone has a KFC moment and it's interesting as we you know talk to our customers, uh, both customers who come often as well as customers who maybe haven't been to KFC in a while. Um, we hear amazing stories about uh, KFC experiences, um, sometimes those stories come with a, a past tense, though. I, I used to uh, come to KFC with my, uh, my grandma or my aunt or my uncle or whoever it might have been. Um, you know, we want people to discover, you know, those new moments of joy uh, that can be found in our food and our experience uh, today. And so that's when we talk about, uh, when I talked uh, earlier about creating modern relevance for modern families uh, with our original food as well as new uh, and more recent innovations to our menu like our chicken sandwich and like our wraps. Okay. When you talk about then creating modern relevance mm -hmm. with, a, with a broader demographic, mm. How does that translate beyond the food? Um, the only other you know, piece of the puzzle that I would share is, is also staying you know, always on with value, um, with everyday value on core menu items and, and on new menu items uh, so, that, uh, so that we can really drive you know, repeat visitation and more frequent visitation of, uh, of KFC, even among our existing customers. Okay. Mm -hmm. How much will the app support the menu launches? Because it seems yeah. to be a, it seems to be more holistic now that you've got a lot of those digital pieces in place as you expand those demographics. So, tell me how you're working with the digital team, and uh, you say frequency. That's what I think of. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Our digital customer, uh, on average, is a uh, is a more valuable customer to us. They come more frequently. Um, they buy more of our food and our, our you know, finger licking good food on, on the app. And uh, so we're aggressively uh, really trying to acquire and, and um, uh, recruit new uh, app downloads and new uh, app and, and dot com users. Uh, I would also say, uh, you know, a key priority for us is to continue to improve that experience. So it's as seamless as personalized, as customized, um, as fast as possible. And I think a great example of that was our introduction of, of quick pickup, which is particularly beneficial to us right now. So I think, um, as you've, you've likely seen, uh, in a inflationary environment in which customers are, uh, are looking at um, every dollar they spend with, with uh, scrutiny, some of the delivery business category wide, the uh, cost of delivery has been one of the things that customers have said, you know what, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna bear that cost right now. Um, and for us, quick pickup has been an amazing solution for us right now in that type of, uh, in that type of environment because people can order ahead on our app uh, and have their food you know, waiting, waiting for them to, to come, in, come on in and, and pick up in store. Uh, very conveniently, very fast and, and easy. Um, and these are all new ways that, that uh, younger customers and younger families want to interact with a brand. Uh, 
certainly a gap. It's no surprise to anyone in our in our digital solutions that we offer customers. A gap right now is a rewards program. Mm -hmm. uh, we we uh, and we're working very hard, as we've said publicly in the past, to uh, uh, to fill that gap in a in a uniquely KFC way. Okay. Uh, so um, we're that learning a lot. That in, means in that we area. can look for uh, some type of program or. I don't think we're prepared, I, but we've said, <laughs> you know, publicly, uh, you know, loyalty sure. rewards is certainly a, uh, a priority for us. Uh, we don't have anything to announce with regard to uh, timing of that or uh, at, at this point, but it's a massive priority for our business because we, we want to reward our, yeah. our most loyal customers and our most frequent customers and our most valuable customers with great, uh, uh, you know, great rewards and in, in our um, you know, for their behavior okay. and for their interaction with our brand. As you add more of these digital pieces then, mm -hmm. especially quick pickup, like you said, mm -hmm. of course you have delivery, you've got mm -hmm. the kiosks um, ramping up. Yep. Um, tell me, have you seen a, a mix shift in your demographic? Are you moving in any kind of direction? Tell me what type of progress you're able to share with some of the priorities that you have to, to expand your demographic base. We have. Uh, we've seen a demographic shift. Um, uh, we saw uh, uh, a, a fairly rapid demographic shift in our Jack Harlow uh, promotion last year with the uh, the Jack Harlow uh, chicken sandwich meal. That was really a, a, a great moment for our brand. Uh, we continued to see uh, a demographic shift with the um, mac and cheese bowl promotion, uh, the $5 mac and cheese bowl that we ran throughout the summer. and. Um, and so, yeah, the beginning uh, of, of 2022 uh, for the KFC brand, the first half of 2022 was a bit rough. I mean, we were all fighting a, a spike in the Omicron virus. We were facing uh, labor shortages in our restaurants. We were facing, uh, uh, our franchisees were facing cost of goods inflation. It was a tough time for our business. But really, as we launched the Jack Harlow meal in the back half of, in, in June of 2022, continued that with the Mac and Cheese Bowl into the Famous Bowl, uh, a Famous Bowl promotion as well, we absolutely saw, you know, uh, the appeal of chicken sandwich, the appeal of our bowls uh, business to, uh, to a younger customer uh, and a younger, younger demographic. And we also, uh, you know, started to, uh, with the value-based offerings, started to see some pickup in our transaction total transaction volumes. Yeah. Um, so how, if we talk about expanding the demographic and sort of making it, you know, uh, to maybe a younger uh, audience, mm -hmm. how, how do you support that with the marketing channels that you prioritize? Have you shifted your priority into spend? Have you shifted your social spend, for example, from TV? Um, Anything that you can tell me about that mix as you as you have this priority in place? Yes, we, we don't break out or report our total media investment dollars, but I can share that uh, certainly uh, the way we uh, reach and engage uh, younger demographics of, of customers is 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 different. Um, and it uh, is, is you know, candidly one of the things in, in my past that uh, I learned a lot about in, in my prior uh, Careers um, in terms of talking to uh, to younger families with kids in the household, in that case about video games. Um, but uh, but yes, what what we've seen is um, traditional linear television has certainly become um, an older uh, demographic over time, uh, with um, live sports effectively dominating uh, traditional television in a way that it's it, it never been done in, in history. What we've done is, um, it, it's not that uh, younger people watch less video. In fact, they consume far more video. They just consume it in uh, much different uh, sp spaces and places than, uh, than some of our older customers. So the biggest shift in our uh, media mix and in our marketing mix has been really a pivot to much more uh, addressable, targeted uh, video, uh, connected TV, online video, uh, streaming video, uh, where uh, uh, with a primary screen, candidly being the mobile phone, uh, not n not always the you know 65 inch TV on 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 your wall. So, um, 
how we engage people in, in through paid media has changed a lot. How we're in, in engaging younger customers through uh, social and digital has also changed. Um, we've our, uh, we have a lot of fun and are and are very creative and um, with our our TikTok uh, uh, marketing, with our Instagram marketing, um, but not always in in uh, necessarily like, you know silly crazy ways. We were the first you know brand I think ever that did a TikTok giving challenge last year uh, to raise money for for uh, for good uh, to to fight uh, hunger to fight hunger inequality um, and income inequality uh, throughout the country and so the TikTok giving challenge last year was was kind of a key highlight for us mm -hmm. in in that space but even through um, through the holidays we did a uh, very fun program called the KFC Sharemobile in which and it was kind of a social first, digital first, with a live event component of an actual KFC uh, mobile food truck uh, that uh, went around the country to some of our some of the areas of the country that were hardest hit by crises last year, and we ended up serving over seventy thousand meals to uh, to families in need in the month of December, um, and you know, fanning the the the, the Fanning the flames of, of uh, our KFC for Good initiatives via digital, via social, um, is important uh, to our younger consumers. It's how they find out about it, and it's how they can get involved. A and um, and it builds builds some brand love. Um, sure. So we're excited about that. Yeah, and you bring up an interesting point about what younger consumers like mm -hmm. and what they say they like. You know, there sometimes I've found there's a little bit of a disconnect in what they say and what they actually buy. Mm. And, um, but you know, they do gravitate toward benevolent brands. Mm -hmm. um, that in mind, are, are, do you have any updates on the beyond? Platform. I mean, mm -hmm. no, that was a huge deal, um, first to market, and mm -hmm. um, I, I just was curious: is that is that uh, something that will be revisited, or? Uh, you know, we we maintain our relationship with Beyond. Um, Beyond uh, has rolled out in a couple of markets uh, internationally as well in the KFC global system. Um, uh, we have nothing further to announce or, or talk about uh, with regard to Beyond at this time. Uh, you know, we were we were pleased with the promotion uh, last week last year, and um, yeah, that's probably that's that's where it stands right now. Okay, mm -hmm. very good, fair mm -hmm. enough. Um, it, I, you know, it does seem like your shift is close closer to the menu than it's been, as we kind of talked about. Yeah, and y I know you talked a lot about you know kind of looking at this barbell menu. Mm. Um, so I do want to talk and, and get your unique perspective on where the consumer is. Mm -hmm. um, right now because I have to write about where you know the outlook and uh, it's hard to articulate because nobody really understands if we're gonna have a soft landing mm -hmm. uh, what that means for KFC mm -hmm. which has historically been you know bucket driven mm -hmm. which may I don't know is it fair to say may drive away some value customers is mm -hmm. that a priority for you then to make sure that when you are doing these innovation in innovation launches uh, with the wrap and, and so on that you try to shift that narrative in this environment, and mm -hmm. then if you could tack that on what you're seeing overall from the consumer. We're sti still seeing at this point, uh, value is critically important to the consumer. Um, the consumer needs to understand that they're getting good value for their money. Um, and there's multiple ways to, uh, to attain that value, uh, whether it's in uh, quick service restaurants, um, whether it's in the grocery channel. And um, so we're very aware that we need to provide um, compelling, good value for the money uh, for every segment of our business, meaning that we look at it from an omni-channel perspective. In whatever way the consumer, the guest, wants to interact and engage with uh, KFC, are we ensuring that we're providing good value for the money in that vehicle or in that channel? So let me give you an example. So we look at... Um, value for individual occasions right so for and i think the new kfc chicken wraps are a great example of that this is a, a lunch product a snacking product an on-the-go product it's an anytime product 
uh, at a great value of, of really two abundant wraps with chicken tenders and coleslaw and pickles, you know, um, and mayo uh, at a two for five, you know, value for an individual occasion. But also we know that families, um, y- you know, families still want to feed those groups of four, groups of five, groups of six um, at a price point that they can afford um, and that uh, feels like good value. So uh, we're also uh, really, you know, carefully protecting and ensuring that our buckets and our bucket meals and our family meals still provide great value for uh, for uh, easy home meal replacement uh, every night of the week. And um, we have to compete against grocery. We, uh, it, you know, against grocery retail. We have to compete against um, fast casual or other alternatives that the customer has in the market. And um, and getting in, you know, eight piece, twelve piece uh, bucket with two large sides, a beverage bucket, et cetera, is a great way that people can do that at, at KFC. And then the third and final example I'll give you is um, digital value. So. Um, you know, increasingly important for us, increasingly important for, for, for consumers. I saw some data last week from the NPD group that indicated that digital, uh, digital couponing and digital value was, was up significantly uh, year over year, up I think the fastest among the subcategories that they were tracking and, um, and uh, equally important to, uh, to us. Um, we are, have our currently rolling out a uh, second generation of our e-commerce platform. I don't know if we've really talked about this a lot, but there are um, significant differences, even visually, that you could see if you had used the KFC app uh, a few weeks ago uh, versus using the KFC app right now. And this rollout, like many app updates, is staggered across the country. um, And we're about 50% of the way complete. But our new e-commerce platform allows us a little bit more flexibility in promotions, targeted promotions, and the ability to, to generate uh, you know, customized offers for, uh, cus- uh, for people who use our app. Um, so this is a, um, we wanna make sure that people uh, get the app, not only to order ahead, not only to customize their order, not only to use quick pickup, but also to, uh, not only to get delivery, but also to make sure that they can find a great deal on that app every every single day. So now if you go into the app, for example, uh, it depends on what territory you're in, only 50% of the country has rolled out so far, but um, there's a special offers section of our app that uh, didn't exist mm-hmm. a few weeks okay. ago. Let's put Very it that good. way. Mm-hmm. I, I want to ask, it sounds like you're ground floor in a lot of these initiatives, mm. um, especially the menu uh-huh. um, yep. and digital. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the, 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 the space is becoming more uh, interestingly uh, intense. Mm-hmm. You know, w- one of your peers reported yesterday, they're talking about taking share in, in chicken. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of the feedback they get is to bring back wraps. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, so mm-hmm. I just want to know what you're most looking forward to from a competitive standpoint as you start to you know expand your occasions with some of these launches mm-hmm. um, and it start to expand your demographic as per your priority mm-hmm. people love chicken worldwide and more people are consuming more chicken uh, worldwide and here in the united states and kfc is the world's greatest fried chicken i can't imagine being in a better spot uh in the category to, to capture, frankly, that overall growth of the chicken category, um, we just have to get back to doing what we do really, really well, which is the world's most distinctive, most flavorful original recipe fried chicken, first and foremost. So, you know, a- as we go out with nuggets, uh, we were very intentional with the original recipe flavoring, the 11 herbs and spices, the, the taste and quality of the nuggets is as good as our original recipe uh, fried chicken on the bone uh, and fried chicken in buckets. And so for me, I'm most excited about being at the epicenter of a global movement in terms of chicken consumption, uh, knowing that uh, we have the world's best when we do it right. Um, And when we make the right and most relevant offerings on our menu, 
to our customers. Uh, so, you know, if there's one thing you'll see from KFC in the year ahead, it's um, maintaining the highest possible standard for taste, quality, uh, convenience, and service. You know, that's when we get to the joy of finger licking good. Uh, and if we can get to and deliver the joy of finger licking good food, taste, quality, service, convenience to our customers, um, you know, we'll win. Uh, we'll win. There's nobody that can hang with our chicken. There's Very nobody good. that can hang with our fried chicken. Well, I'm excited about everything that you have coming up. And Thank you. I certainly appreciate your time. And you too.